Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson. And this week, we're continuing our conversation with Dr. Tina Opie from last week, where we explore her book, Shared Sisterhood, and discuss topics like bias and diversity and ways we can show up differently. I hope you enjoy. So so talk to us about these practices of digging and bridging, because, mm-hmm. you know, and you say this in your book, even though the book is focused on specifically, you know, relationships between black women and white women, really, these are tools that are effective in bridging any kind of relationships. Mm-hmm. And so, so let's start with digging. Yeah, so dig is an introspective practice where you examine your own beliefs, assumptions, thoughts. So you literally take them and and for those, you know, if this is an idea or a thought, you would hold it up, like sort of detach it from yourself and say, what is this? How did I come to define things in this way? And I'll use, this is a, I'm taking a risk here. I'm making myself vulnerable, sharing a story where I had to dig. So when my son, who's turning 21 this year, was probably four or five, was pre-K, he had a temperature, he couldn't go to school. But he was really, he felt fine, but he couldn't go to school. And I was working on my dissertation or on my PhD. And I didn't know how I was going to meet this deadline. I'm like, I need to tire this boy out. So I want to go to the park. Go to the park. The park is packed. And I'm shocked because it's like one o'clock. I'm like, everybody's supposed to be at work. Then I notice, hmm, a lot. Wait a minute. These women seem to be short in stature. Hmm. They're brown and they have long black straight hair. I'm like, are these people supposed to be here? I think mm. I think even is this legal? Why are they taking up my so these are the thoughts that mm-hmm. are coming in my mind? And I always say people deny having bias, which is a lie from yeah, the pit of, yeah. pit of hell. Bias is like birds, it will fly through your mind, just don't let them nest there. Right. So they're they're gonna it's so if the birds flew through my head, but rather than letting them nest there, rather than being emboldened by that bias and going up to a woman and saying, Do you belong here? This yeah. is my swing, get out of my park. Are you here illegally? I didn't do any of that. I called my husband. I said, honey, I'm such a racist. I cannot believe that these thoughts went in my head. Then I began to dig. Why did that come into my mind in a millisecond? I realized, okay, so the face of illegal immigration, undocumented undocumented people is often people of Latinx descent or Hispanic Mm -hmm. descent. Mm -hmm. They often show women, women with children, Mm-hmm. Or they'll show men. Remember when the prior president talked about caravans? Like there's right. so there's a right. narrative which is just so <laughs> infuriating. But there's this narrative of people trying to steal, cheat, cut the line, get in, and get something for nothing. That had been embedded in my mind. Yeah. And so I had to then say, okay, well, what, Tina? Educate yourself on immigration. What's going on? Then I started to do all the research and finding out about how our government favors people from lighter skin companies, uh, countries. Like they, they have this thing where they value certain kinds yeah. of occupations more than others, certain countries more than others, which explains why if there is turmoil, which, by the way, the United States government may have contributed to causing in another country, people from these countries may be feel compelled to protect their family to protect our life. If I had children in another country and I was trying to figure out how to feed them, I might cross something. Yeah. Illegal. Like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, let's, let's just be, if you are that desperate, people are mm-hmm. not walking across a river just because they're not lazy. No, they're not. You, there's desperation in their eyes and in their stories. And there's a system that is preventing people from being able to come as readily as they might like. That's what digging is. Yeah. So the bias is that you recognize the bird, you examine it, you don't let it nest, you mm. definitely do not act upon it. Mm. You examine why that bird flew th- through your mind and then you redress that. You you educate yourself. And then you're ready to bridge. So y- you know, if if when I have had Beth and I have talked about digging when it comes to racial ethnicity, 
One of the reasons why I introduced, because because Dig and Bridge, that came up. Uh, I'm a person who likes to, I'm a visionary. So I sometimes will act before I've thought everything through. So I did this post on Facebook in a, in a mom's group. I was like, hey, who would be interested in a shared sisterhood workshop? Just an hour and a half, two hours. Over 100 women went to come. Mm. I could only have like 30 because it was in the yoga place. So I, we pick all the women, but then I realized, okay, girl, now you don't have this workshop. What are you going to say? And so I had to come up with a way to quickly explain how I thought women were of different racial ethnicities were talking past each other. But first we needed to interrogate. So that's how I came up with the idea of dig. I had a shovel. I was like, we need to get beneath all that yeah. crap that yeah. we hear about each other. Then we need, then we can bridge. Sometimes people, I've had white women who've tried to bridge with me before they've done dig work and they can actually cause harm. You know, I, women have, can I touch your hair? No, I'm not a museum piece. I'm not an animal. I I get it. You're curious about what my hair feels like because it's different. But have you ever read, have you ever read about black women's hair? Have you ever, I mean, people have, strangers have touched my hair and I will rub their chin. I'll go... (laughs) And, and, and it immediately it's jarring and that's what needs to happen. So before you try to connect with someone, you have to dig. You have to ask, why do I want to connect with this person? Is it just because they're black? Yeah. Is it just because they're gay? Is it just because whatever, they're a man or a woman? And if, if it's only that, my, I would encourage you to do more research on that particular group that you're interested in. Follow some people on social media. Watch documentaries. Watch movies made by... Our, our social networks are so racially homogenous. Yeah. And there's such an opportunity to learn. Now, my white girlfriends who are close to me have, they can touch my hair. I mean, it's soft. It feels like cotton. You know, it's, they know that. It, but it's a totally different situation where there's someone, a stranger who comes up and it's like when pregnant women are pregnant. Sometimes right. strangers will rub the belly. Yeah. But it feels even more intrusive because it's my head and there's so much history around black people being patted on the head rubbed on the head like little kids Mm. when they're 80 years old so anyway that i digress Mm -mm, you can digress all the way it's (laughs) that was i was gonna say that was that was one of the parts uh of the book that i was like oh shit i've done that like i you know like i i've tried to i i think i may have done it this week right where like i you know, saw somebody in a session and was like trying to build a relationship with them, you know, because they were the only I could tell that they were the only, you know, black person in this session. And and I was like, oh, like it didn't feel right. Right. Like mm-hmm. I could just tell. And I was like and when I was rereading some of the sections that I had highlighted from my first read of your book, I was like, well, shit there. Yep. I was trying to bridge without digging. I was trying to. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, and and whether that is because sometimes I think. And, and you 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 said this in that section too of like you can think you're the exception <laughs> like as yeah, the white woman you can think you're that. the exception and like because i i know one you know one of the most and i'll give um i am so fortunate and i know she will listen to this but uh a, a good friend of mine and colleague stephanie I'm so grateful. I'll just say that I'm so grateful for her willingness to take risks with me to help me see things. And, you know, and and she's the one who really pushed me one time of like, are you doing this because you want to help? Are you doing this because you want to be seen as a good white person? Yeah. And I was like, God damn it. Like, yep. Yep. Hadn't even considered that. Right. Yeah. But it, it was true. Yeah. Well, our egos are, are, I think people lie to themselves. Oh, I just did. It was selfless. Girl, you're the worst person. Yeah. <laughs> I suspect you. You're the one who did it because we shouldn't deny our egos. I mean, all yeah. of us have egos. All of us may engage in hubris at times. Yeah. So I think it's important to to pause long enough to see that. But I do want to say that sometimes people want to dig and dig and dig and dig and yeah. for the sake of digging. So they educate themselves, but they never try to bridge. They never yeah. try to apply what they've learned. And, and we saw a lot of that in the summer of racial reckoning or when George Floyd right. and others were murdered. There were so many white women who went out and bought how to be an anti-racist, mm-hmm. white fragility. And they I, I, they marked it up, they read it, but and they digged and they felt better about themselves, mm. but they didn't take it to work. Mm-hmm. They did not help people. And part of the challenge is you may have tried to bridge before you did dig, 
But there's something to be said about making the effort and then realizing, okay, I needed to dig more. Because what I don't want is people to feel like they have to stay in the dig phase for five years before they try to bridge. Yeah. Because it's an iterative process. You'll dig and then you try to bridge and you're like, oh God, I totally forgot. Okay. No, let me go back and dig. Okay. Let me bridge. Okay. Let's dig. And then what you're trying to do, because if you had the opportunity to go back to that person, the Black person you try to reach out to, say you see them again, or maybe you send them an email. Maybe you say, you know what? I don't know you, you don't know me, but et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I I really wanted to apologize for approaching you in the way that I did. Whatever, I would love to get to know you better, blah, blah, blah. And maybe they reach out, maybe they don't. Yeah, yeah. But the idea is to begin practicing these tools of assessing ourselves. And rather than you, because what can happen in those situations, they're like, she was just standoffish. I sure. was fine. Right, right, I was right, friendly. right. Like, I'm, I did it. I'm, I'm, I'm the good person, right? Like, that reinforces, yeah. that reinforces, like, I'm the, I'm the white hero. Yeah, right? and that was just an angry person. They were just an yeah. angry black person. That you're, so it's, we have to catch ourselves when we're in the, I mean, it's the process of being human. I hate to say it, but yeah. we categorize, we use heuristics to sort people, to decide who we want to talk to. We like to validate ourselves. So we look for confirming information rather than information that would uh, challenge our beliefs about ourselves even. So when we're confronted with information, my children told me that I was mean. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm funny. And then I was like, well, what do they mean? I need to mm. actually mm. probe deeper. And I do, I'm sorry. Then I get into the generational thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm mean because I didn't give y'all a trophy. And I'm, I'm not, that's not happening. <laughs> but anyway, so, but it's an opportunity to learn more about yeah. what they're saying. And, and again, we don't have to agree, but the process of investigating those thoughts and, and learning more as I try to develop a relationship, even with my children, is a critical step. So, so once you've done dig, then you're ready to bridge. Bridge is about connecting with people who are different than you, centering the value of equity, where you demonstrate that we've been talking about risk-taking, vulnerability, trust, and empathy. And each of those four things are necessary, but not sufficient Yeah. for an authentic connection. So it's when people, you know, I define authenticity as when your internal experience aligns with your external expression. And both of those are aligned with your deeply held values. Mm-hmm. So I commonly use the example of, so I don't curse, right? I, don't, I, don't, I used to curse like a sailor and I'm actually a sailor's daughter. But when I, when, when I give somebody the finger in the car, that's not me being authentic. Mm-hmm. That's me being upset at the man who I let go and who gave me the finger. So I responded. But if I had time to slow down, Mm. I wouldn't do that. Because mm. then I was like, Lord, what if this man shows up at church on Sunday <laughs> and I'm up here preaching the Mother's Day sermon and he is like, that's the girl who gave me the bird. Yeah. You know, so that's not me being authentic. That's me being emotionally uh, immature, carried away, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, angry. So being able to develop a relationship where you can have those conversations. Cause you know, I'm a Christian, Beth's an atheist. We've had lots of conversations where we don't see eye to eye, but we respect each other. Yeah. And we've taken, I have a, I have a, I have a friend um, who I worked with before and she's a gay woman. She doesn't like to be called a lesbian, but we, she will ask me questions about racial ethnicities and I ask her questions about L- the LGBTQ community. And if any of those were taped, we would both be, sent to Siberia, sent away, because we are asking about the birds Mm. that fly through our Mm. heads. And it's Mm. safe for us to do that. But, you know, and sometimes it feels as though even sharing that a bird flew through your brain is enough to get you annihilated. And and I don't like that. That that is Mm. um, really concerning to me that if you, it feels like there's thought police on both uh, on now. See, I'm, I'm, it's not a both sides issue. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Some of the fascism that I see right. is not equivalent to these no. things. But I have some of my progressive friends. I'm like, so you're telling me that because I'm a Christian. I'm a what? Like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. I think yeah. we have to begin to examine ourselves and I am sticking. So I have a a lot more affiliations with people in in that camp than I do with people who are 
uh, right wing evangelical and they, you know evangelical Christians may identify as Christian. I don't identify with what yeah the Jesus they're worshiping. I don't recognize that point about being able to interrogate it and name it. You know, it's interesting because I feel like I feel like for me it's it's just been a fairly recent thing. And only with people, right, that are like yeah. really close to me. You know, I remember there was just recently, you know, there was, a, I live in suburbia, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I moved from a very racially diverse neighborhood to one that's not. Mm-hmm. And Nick and I were walking and there was this um, new family that just moved into this really like uh, one of the nicest houses on the block, mm-hmm. right? And it's, a, and it's I, I, I don't know for sure, but I think they're Hispanic. Mm-hmm. And I told Nick, I was like, damn, I just had a racist thought. Like mm-hmm. I just, uh, right, the bird flew by. And I was like, I literally had the thought of like, oh, are they just like keeping an eye on the house or did they buy the house? And I was like, yeah. man. And, and what I realized is like, I don't know that a, a year or two ago, two or three years ago, even if I would have felt safe or comfortable, or maybe I would have even caught it, it would have just happened. I don't even know what I would have done with it. But I think there is a lot of power for us to go like, man, yeah, I said that. And I don't like that. And now I'm going to interrogate, right? Like you said, like, where did that come from? And even just to name it, um, I love, I love that visual of like, the bird's going to fly through, just don't let it nest. Sometimes they nest and we don't realize it. Yeah. Um, and so, and having that space to be able to share openly and, and say, wow, I just had that. And because that's one of the things that you, um, you talk about early in your book about this idea of how so often when we are presented with information that is in maybe conflict with our sense of moral self, Mm -hmm. right. That we can default to, to denial, deflection, avoidance, defensiveness, and yeah. yeah, defensiveness. And and I really appreciate it. What you wrote, which was, you know, sisters are encouraged to choose uh, r- reparative actions that emphasize their willingness to listen and change. Um, overall, self image is threatened, making yourself vulnerable in moments of failure, or lapse is difficult. But it's that vulnerability is that that's what's needed. Yeah. And I and I know as a again speaking as a, a white woman in my lived experience that that fear of messing up of Mm -hmm. like perfectionism and having to sort of right size the the thing that i think about is like i have to right size my discomfort because my discomfort in no way compares to the pain and suffering of right and and how do we navigate that and so i'm just curious to get your thoughts yeah and i think the the way to illustrate my thoughts is to share a story so Mm. I am, I'm a very emotional person, meaning I will cry at a commercial at the drop of a hat. But of course, when I'm doing this work, I keep, I, I, I'm often facilitating a conversation. So I don't get into, I keep my emotions in check. Yeah. But there was one time I, I have a shared sisterhood Facebook group. And for a time we were meeting like once a week, we were having these really deep conversations. And we, I was asking people, specifically white women, to use their power on behalf of members of historically marginalized groups. And this one white woman said, well, you know, I'm afraid to do that. And so I started mm-hmm. asking her why. And what really, well, what it came down to is wanting to be liked and wanting to be seen as nice. And I burst into tears. Mm. Because it was, I was like, do you realize that I don't even expect people to like me at work? Mm. Like, I just don't want to go to a hostile work environment where people are actively seeking to harm me, being disliked is a Thursday. Mm. Like that's just a regular day. And if you, if white women are waiting for the moment where they feel like they're nice and liked to say something, then it's hopeless mm. because you're never going, I mean, what do you, what do you say? I feel like I've reached the top of my likeness scale. So now I can start engaging in <laughs> oh collective my action. I right. mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like, right. I mean, for some people, money. Yeah. How much is enough? I haven't reached that point yet. When I do, I'll let you know. Mm. It's the same thing with wanting to be liked or being nice. And I just felt so hopeless in that moment because I'm, you know, we're bearing our hearts and souls. We've been having these weekly conversations. And she's like, I just want to be liked. And I was like, oh my God. Because there's nothing that I can say to you that will make you focus 
on another path if what your primary concern is is being liked and nice. Yeah. And there's a quote of what is you know uh, hi- w- history makers were not. I can't remember what it is, but it's basically, basically like nice girls never made history right. or something like right. that. And in that moment, I lost it. Mm-hmm. And, and that really moved. They were like, oh, my gosh, because that's rare for that to happen with me in a context like that. But that's how I feel. I, I feel as I 100 percent agree with you that my discomfort of raising an issue or if someone tells me that I am um, I made a religious mistake, the discomfort that I feel when that's pointed out to me, in no way compares to Islamophobia. Right. Right. It just, it doesn't, you know, after 9-11, people having, being attacked, being violently, having, you know, having their houses, uh, being afraid for their safety. Th- that little situation pales in comparison. And, yeah. and I'm using myself as an example because I do think sometimes People say, oh, she's a Black woman. Oh, I need to defer. Listen, we all have areas of our lives where we may be historically power dominant and historically uh, marginalized. Now, all of those identities are not equal. And I'm sorry, I focus a lot on racial ethnicity because in this country, that has mm-hmm. been the basis of a lot of the inequities that we have. And, and Black people built this country. And I will st- stand by that. I will continue to stand by that. We have never been received our just due. And we are still fighting just to be seen as full humans. Yeah. You know, one, um, Didi Delgado, she she runs an organization mm-hmm. done for Didi. Mm-hmm. And the first time I was introduced to her work, she had put a post out that sort of stopped me in my tracks. Mm. And, and it was, uh, the gist of it was, white people benefit from oppression and they benefit from the undoing of the opp- oppression, mm-hmm. right? And, and that is so true. I've, yeah. I've, I've experienced that where people are like, what are you doing? Iowa white girl talking about, you know, like, and, and I'm like, oh, I've just benefited from trying to push against my own, right? Like racist DNA. Like I've just yeah. benefited from that. And like, and you don't have racist DNA. So oh, I, no, this is, thank you for it's, that. It's not, don't, yeah. it's, cause, cause we have to be careful. Cause that's thank what you. some people interpret it where they think yeah. that we're saying white people are born racist. no, yeah. There's nothing wrong with being white. It is right. whiteness. Whiteness in the sense of that being a hierarchy of race where white is at the top and black is at the bottom. That is the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. It, it is not being white. White people are not born racist. Okay. But what happens is you're engrafted into a system that privileges white skin. Yeah. And as a result... And, and, you know, I heard someone, I don't, I can't remember her name. I think it was on TikTok or Instagram or something. And she said she had a parent who got really upset with her because she was talking about white privilege. And she said, let's think about people with disabilities. I don't have a disability. So I may have struggled in life, but it wasn't because I didn't have a disability. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. say I could not walk and I need a wheelchair. There's so many buildings with no ramps, but steps. Right. So I have an advantage because I can walk and it doesn't mean that I don't have disadvantage because of class or something else. Yeah. But the disadvantage that I have is not because I can walk. Yeah. That's not the problem. But for other people, the disadvantage is they cannot walk. And so they're seeing the system. What they see is steps. They see difficulty. When my husband, sometimes he'll park in the driveway in such a way that it blocks the sidewalk. I'm like, Move on the street or move in the driveway. But you can't block the sidewalk because there could be somebody with a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. Or a stroller who doesn't want to go in. I mean, we live in an area where it would be fine, but you see what I'm saying. You don't want to force somebody to have to go into the busy road when they can have a sidewalk, a paved yeah. sidewalk. So anyway, that's- No, 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 no. I, I, pre- I really appreciate you pushing on that language and, and, and clarifying that just to make sure that I'm articulating that accurately because I think that's the, the you know, it's like the- yeah, I mean, it is the system. We were just we were just uh, interviewing Neha Sampat, and mm. she was like, "It's the system. It's the system. It's the system." Like that's part of the like, and and recognizing how that permeates your beliefs about yeah. yourself, about the world, about right? All people. of that. Yeah. Um, the challenge is 
it's the system, it's the system, it's the system, but the system is us. Yeah, the system, exactly. We have put the system in place. We benefit or we are oppressed or whatever from the system. It is going to take individuals to change the system. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, Beth and I talk about, because we, we look at shared sisterhood as a tool that gets at the hearts and minds of individuals so that we can, and, and talks about laws as policies as well, so that we can engage in collective action to change the system. And some people will push back and say, I don't need pa- people from historically power dominant groups. I don't care about their hearts and minds. Mm. Just treat. But I, I think if we pause, don't you think you have a greater chance of changing someone's behavior if you do positively affect their hearts and minds, if their hearts and minds are engaged? Now, I'm not talking about you have to like me because I don't really care. I am at the age where I don't care as much about that. I don't care if you don't like me. Just treat me with respect and don't discriminate against me at work. Yeah. But if you don't, fine, I don't care. Yeah. But I mean, it is that that point of like, and then how do we move forward with that collective action? I mean, and that, you know, is a phrase you and Beth repeat over and over. It's yes. like, and then what's that collective action? And, you know, I think one of the things I'm really good, normally, normally, Tina, at the end, I'll share like something that resonates with me, but I, I want to share it with you now is like, okay. one of the things that I'm really, I need to, I want to sit with is, I know there are times when I'm just digging, mm-hmm. you know, um, or, or trying to bridge, but not taking the collective action, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, and so that's something I just, um, I'm going to be sitting with and figuring out like how to, how, how, how to be even more courageous and how to be, um, seeing things and, mm-hmm. um, uh, and just finding, yeah. I mean, that's just that, that, that when you were talking about that, like, it's easy to dig and dig and dig. I'm like, yeah, I've been there. Like I've definitely have been yeah. in that place of like intellectually knowing, but not necessarily like change, you know, it, 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 acting on it. And, yeah. and, and that whole point of, right. Like the, like when we can bond together, particularly as women, and when we can, you know, take care and, and make changes that will help those that have been most historically marginalized, it does benefit all of us. It like, does. It, it really does. It really does. And so a couple of things, collective action is about dismantling systemic inequities. And, you know, in the workplace, we talk about, I talk about, we talk about eight, core processes from recruiting, onboarding, socialization, promotion, pay, evaluation. You you can examine any of those systems and then you link arms with people who have gone through DIG and who you've bridged with and you say, okay, how can we begin to chip away at this inequity so that we actually have an equitable workplace? And it might be a pay audit. And we go, we talk through, we give specific examples in the book. That's collective action. And so for people who are listening, who might feel like, okay, I need to dig. So I'm going to get shared sisterhood. I'm going to read. I'm going to practice that stuff. Then I'm going to bridge and I'm going to you know, follow different people on social media, read different books, watch different movies. Okay. Now I'm ready to join a group and I'll join the shared sisterhood Facebook group and we'll start talking about collective action. Here is where something that's really important. We argue that collective action needs to be based on what the members of the historically marginalized mm. groups want solved, mm. not based on what mm. members of the historically power dominant group mm. want solved. And the exa- we talk about allies, accomplices, and co-conspirators in the book, and I really want to draw this. Across. So, you know, whatever you call the language is important. Some people will disagree with this, but we're trying to differentiate between sort of motivation and action. So in the book we talk about, and this is uh, Dr. Tiffany Jana, and again, doctors Ella Bell and Stella and Como, who have been really working on the differentiating these terms. So an ally is someone who believes in equity in theory. So those mm-hmm. are the people who ran out and bought the books, mm-hmm. who highlighted the books, and who may dig and dig and dig, or maybe not. Maybe mm-hmm. they just read the wor- work and they feel good and they can check it off mm-hmm. the checklist. An accomplice is someone who reads the books and who's actually interested in change, but the change is direct is self-directed. It's not yeah. based on, yeah. the, so it's, I, I jokingly say, this would be like if someone, a man told women, I know there's gender inequity. I really believe in that. You guys all need to strike. Yeah. You need to strike, don't come to work tomorrow. And when I go and meet with the executives, I'm going to tell them that that's what I think should happen. And the women are like, we didn't ask you to do that. We don't want that. I have to, I have to come to work. I can't strike. So 
a co-conspirator is someone who believes in equity, who wants to act and will act, but who is informed by the voices of the mm-hmm. members of the historically marginalized group. So the women might say, we don't want to strike. What we want is a pay equity audit and we want retroactive payment for how we were underpaid and we want to be increased going forward. And we want opportunities for promotions. And we want you all to look at how you're assigned in consulting. It was a big deal about who was assigned to what clients. Because mm. there were more, the more prestigious clients tended to go to certain people. On the, sure. And you know, the more HR, DEI kind of functions went to other kinds of people. And those were different trajectories in terms of your promotion rate. That is an accomplice. Or excuse yeah. me, a co-conspirator. A co-conspirator. Yeah. That's a co-conspirator. That's someone who was actually actively working with the historically marginalized community. And then when no, when when he or she or they are in places and spaces where those marginalized individuals are not, he's speaking and they're using their social and political capital on their behalf. Yeah. That's what that's why I would love for people to pursue power. I want you to want to be the CEO of a company because then you're in a position where you can do things like that as opposed to just amassing wealth and power and fame for yourself. And by the way, if you're listening and you're in, some of us have less power than others, but are you using the power that you do have? Mm. Are you even aware of it? Those white Mm. women who wanted to be liked, Mm. who wanted to be considered nice, they were sitting in positions throughout organizations. I'm like, girl, you keep saying you want to be liked. You have power. Why, Why aren't you using that power on behalf of other people? Yeah. As opposed to fixating on whether or not people like you or you're nice. But I also I want to be sensitive. If you are reared and groomed and raised to believe that that is a lot of your capital, that's your card. That's your yeah. ticket to mm-hmm. your MRS. That's how you're going to get married. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's yeah, how you're going to get ahead. <laughs> so, you know, that's how right. you're going to get ahead in life. Being nice. Asking you to... to prioritize something else is almost like getting you to swim against the tide. And so I want to be sensitive to that, but also have white women in particular recognize that's not my issue. Yeah. I want to be respected and I would like to be liked. I think I'm a nice person, but that's not really what I'm worried about when I'm trying to push for equity for the collective. Yeah. I starred, underlined, and boxed this one in. Systems may be audited, but they're rarely adjusted. I That's just right. want to like, I feel like that is the like a mic drop to leave on because that is something we see time and time again. Mm-hmm. We have been a part of like, hey, we've heard, we've heard from the voices. This is what people are saying, right? Like, and nothing takes, and, and it, it's kind of that same, it's almost like a systemic dig, right? Like I've dug, we under, we, we've heard it, so we're good. Like we've, and I'm just making that connection. Like that's a systemic, like you're just gonna stay being digging instead of like actually bridging and taking collective action. But that was one, cause I know we have a lot of folks who listen to the show who are either in leadership positions or in um, HR leadership positions. Like it's not yeah. about the audit. It's well, about the adjustment. And right? I have, I've shocked some people because as a consultant, I can come in and do a study for you, but I will say, you probably have collected enough data. Yeah. What did you do with the data you collected last yeah. year? Yeah. And the year before that, you yeah. can do a longitudinal study probably. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have enough data where you could look at time one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Don't collect any more data. Yeah. Believe what the people have already told <sighs> you. And now what? Now, how would you restructure things? But I'm going to tell you, this is going to sound cynical. Sometimes the audit is the purpose. The repeat right. of the audit is the is the work because they don't really want to change. And we can talk about the right. Fact- it's work avoidance. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 you know, and it's it's work avoidance by doing busy work, mm-hmm. by doing work that you know is going to go in circular file thirteen, mm-hmm. by doing work that you know will never challenge the power dynamics because you're actually afraid of your job. You want to be liked. You want to be nice, even in these powerful positions where you could be driving change. You're, people are concerned about litigation. Mm-hmm. Collecting data is not going to lead to a lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Changing pay structures could. Yeah. And yeah. so I think it's risk avoidance. It's work avoidance. It's also fear of shifting power dynamics. Yeah. Because another thing that I say is, you, the, the, you know, the, the audits often don't lead to adjustment. 
We can analyze our pipeline at the entry level day in and day out. Whatever happened to hiring senior levels in a cohort? We don't often want to do that. If you want to change the power structure of an organization, hiring at the top is a great way to do that. But yeah, many people want to avoid that. And I'm not saying that that's the silver bullet. I'm not saying that that would always work. There's pros and cons to everything that you do. Right. But being oh, just recognizing that hiring better analysts who have right. zero political capital right. is right. not always going to be. That's going to take forever. Yeah. And COVID shows us. Look. If you want to change your organization, you could have a fundamentally different organization in six months if you had to. But many organizations will, first of all, will say that's not true. Mm -hmm. But think about COVID. Mm -hmm. It was an existential threat. Mm -hmm. If you didn't change immediately, you might die. Yeah. Your business might not operate. So it was all hands on deck to figure out how can we continue to function? What if it was all hands on deck to say, how can we be equitable? Yeah. You could have a fundamentally different organization in six months. I believe that. We yeah. just have to have the desire. Okay. So I am curious to hear your answer to the question that we ask all of our new guests, mm -hmm. which is what was a conversation you've had with yourself or with someone else that was transformative? So this is going to air. So I will say <laughs> <laughs> I was at a crossroads because I was deciding, um, what I wanted to do in my career. Mm. And I, I'm not going to get into specifics because I, but, and I yeah. think I was resenting a particular path, but it felt like I'm a Christian. It felt like that's where God was directing me to continue to go. And I was like, I don't want to do that. So I was going kicking and screaming. The conversation I had with myself was Tina, you get to go back. Mm. You get to pursue this path. There are not many people who have been bit privileged to walk this path. It is a privilege for you to do X, Y, Z. That I had to reframe it mm. to more of an abundance mindset because I think I was in a position of scarcity. I was, I sure. was really resenting, feeling like I was out of control, like I was being sort of forced to do things that I didn't want to do. And God had to sit, I had a conversation with him and I talked to several advisors, people in my life who I surround myself with, who will, they will never, they don't, they're like, we love you, but if this hurts your feelings, like I need to let you know, blah, blah, blah. And they did that. And I kept hearing the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I had to dig, I had to say, okay, so you value these people. This is like your board of advisors. They've all said similar things without talking to each other. Mm -hmm. But you still want to do something different? Mm. Girl, get it together. And <laughs> what is it about you that is caused? And it was because I have a strong need for justice. Mm. And I felt some things were unfair in the way I had been treated. Then I had to say, if you believe that God is real and he's directing you towards this path, he's going to take care of some of those things that you may be not be able to take care of right now. So that was a that was a very recent and raw conversation sure. that I had with myself. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. I know there are people who are listening who are curious to know about how they can connect with you and hopefully work with you. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Thank you. So the best way to reach me, my website is, uh, well, across all social media, I'm at Dr. Tina Opie. And if you'd like to connect with me, it's connect at drtinaopie.com. Awesome. And we'll be sure to add all that information in the show notes. And I will just add this that and sometimes we'll do this. If you're interested in a copy of Shared Sisterhood, you certainly can buy it wherever books are sold. But I would be happy to gift the first five people who send us Aww. an email at podcast at com, and we will get a copy sent out to you. Dr. Tina Opie. People don't know that it, it was a journey for us to get here with some technical glitches. <laughs> and but you you are such an absolute you are such a gift to this world. Oh, and I'm so you. fortunate that our paths crossed and continue to cross. And I your work is necessary and critical. And I hope that it reaches beyond the choir that's already singing it, right? Like mm -hmm. it it makes a big difference. And so thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. We'll do a part two. And I know I won't see you on that one platform, but we'll see each other. We'll keep in touch. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Our guest this week has been Dr. Tina Opie. And 
there's so much that we talked about. One of the things that I'm really holding on to is just that metaphor of like biases, treat biases like birds, let them fly through your brain, but don't let them nest there. And like, how do you, how do you clean out your gutter, so to speak? And so um, I cannot recommend her book, Shared Sisterhood with Dr. Beth Livingston enough. I think it's such a powerful and necessary read. And I just want to reiterate, if you would like a free copy, send us an email at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com. You can find me on social media where my DMs are always open. And we always want to hear what came up for you, what resonated for you? What are you curious about? Um, what questions came up for you? So we love to hear from you. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so in two ways. The first is really simple. Rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform. This helps us increase visibility and exposure so we can continue to bring on excellent guests like Dr. Tina Obi. And if you'd like to financially support the team that makes this show possible, you can do so by becoming a patron. You can go to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations, where your financial support will support the team and you'll get access to ad-free shows, you'll get the shows early, and some pretty great, unique show swag. I want to just do a big shout out to the team that makes this show possible, to our producer, Nick Wilson, to our sound editor, Drew Knoll, our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing consultant, Jessica Burge, and the rest of the Snowco crew. And just a big final thank you to Dr. Tina Opie and the incredible work that she's doing and everything that she has brought to this world. So I was so excited to get the chance to be in conversation with her. This has been Conversations on Conversations. Thank you so much for listening, for giving us your time. And remember, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So until next week, please be sure to rest, rehydrate, and we'll see you again soon.